India has 275 million school going children. Today with AI etc, you can literally build an AI tutor for every single child. It's pretty well understood in education that if everybody has a tutor, the potential that could be realized is just tremendous. Hi, I am Sophie Vaux and this is the Rise and Play podcast. A few weeks ago, I had a wonderful and transformative experience in India during IGDC and I want to share the key learnings with you. Great leadership comes from everywhere. And I want to bring perspectives from the East to the West so that we can continue learning from each other. In this special series, I am sitting down with five studio founders to offer a broad perspective on the gaming ecosystem in India now, ranging from early stage companies to more mature stages, from bootstrap to VC-backed, from casual to mid-core, serving the global or the local market. Are you ready to challenge your beliefs and perception? Let's begin. So hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Rise and Play and we are continuing our on our exciting special series about India, gaming in India and here today is even a more special one because it's not exactly just pure gaming but education. Today I'm super excited to have uh, Rishi uh, representing Supernova, an AI tutor for every child now where games in a broader sense, meets education and technology. So uh, Rishi is uh, the CEO and co-founder of Supernova, founded uh, roughly two, more than two years ago. And I'm here today to go through your journey, how you started. So welcome, Rishi, uh, to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Yeah, very happy to be here. So let's begin maybe before Supernova. Uh, and I'll make sure to link to the show notes some video and trailer because I think it's very self-explanatory what you're doing with Supernova. Sure. What have you done before? What is your background? Where was it in uh, games, in business, in technology that led you to found Supernova? I come from this small town called Dindigal, right? It's in, uh, it's in Tamil Nadu, which is one of the, uh, you know, 20, 29 states of India, right? So a small town life and middle-class family. And uh, for a long time, I went to the same school, you know, got on the same bus, went to my school for almost 12 years, right? Same school in my town. And that was until class 10. And I was always, a, you know, a, a kid who was able to do well in exams, which anything related to, uh, you know, chess, those kind of things, anything that was very intellectual, I was able to perform well. So right after 10th, my dad found this ad for this thing called IIT JE Coaching Center. Uh, just to give you some context, IIT is the best engineering college of the country. But somewhere my father believed I could do it. And, you know, my fam my dad was very much about what is essential and what is just, you know, things that you can live uh, without very grounded kind of a person. So most of the time, you know, if I wanted a new shirt or I wanted to go somewhere on a trip, even those things he would think twice before spending. A lot of times he'll advise me to, you know, stay within your means, etc. But when it comes to education, he never holds back. And, you know, it costs a lot to prepare for these entrance examinations. Somehow, you know, he took a loan, etc. and put me in this school that was good at getting people through IID examinations. So then I went to Chennai and then my whole life changed because suddenly I'm living in a metro. Chennai is one of the six, you know, one of the top cities of India. Uh, I was lucky enough to get into IID. There, you're surrounded by ambitious individuals, right? Everybody is like IID, just to give you some context, Sundar Pichai of Google is from an IID. Right. So, you know, I start coding, etc. And uh, that's when I start dabbling with startups, building things, putting out in the market. Right. I built this thing called Myra Medicine along with uh, Anirudh built it. I took care of product data science uh, there. It was a hyper local delivery startup. We scaled it to $15 million, sold it to another company named Medlife, spent a bunch of time there. And by this time, I understand how to build product. What is technology? How do you know what is an MVP? How do you trade? Things like that. Right. And then when Myra journey came to an end, I could basically wanted to see what I wanted to do with all of these skill sets. And for me, I went back to my roots. What made me who I am is education, as you can see, the whole IIT thing, right? So uh, I decided that there was a lot of problems to be solved in education. And that's why we got started here. Before we get into the start of Supernova, and this is coming from my observation also with quite many very intelligent people, entrepreneurs, and there's always the appetite to do more, bigger, uh, stronger. You know, it's, it's, it's almost... Um, a pursuit for status, wealth, 
And you could yes. have continued on that ride, like be the elite of the country and build, I don't know, uh, the big unicorn of India, whatever it is, uh, in the tech, especially like Google and, and star, such. But you decided anyway, introspect, go back to your roots. How could I use my skill to do something meaningful for me that means something to me and at scale with impact? What was the process for you? I don't know if there's some, some events that happen or it's by nature you are someone still connected to your roots. What differed you from maybe other entrepreneurs that I've seen would go just forward and be bigger, you know, chase this even more? So I think I'm not sure if I've gotten out of that loop yet because I think <laughs> here in Supernova, the dream is to make it big, right? Yeah. Uh, someday, the, I know, uh, India has 250 million kids, right? About 300 million kids, actually, right? So you can imagine, you know, if you're building for India education and if you succeed, uh, you know, it's going to be a legacy, huge thing. So I, I still think I am continuing on that dream of doing big things. Uh, now, having said that, I had some criteria. It was not really, first of all, it was not like you asked me whether I'm that kind of a person. Actually, I think I was an entrepreneurial person for sure. Uh, you know, doing things, taking risks, etc. But when I got into a job, I should admit that I did get into a very comfortable zone where you know, there's not a lot of uh, <laughs> uncertainty. Everything is just falling in place. You're getting money in the bank every month. So, you know, and uh, it was nice. But somewhere I felt, while it was nice and comfortable and all, somewhere I felt the longing for uh, doing something that was meaningful. I couldn't be satisfied with a job where, I you know, I had a small part of a funnel. I could improve it over six months. Somewhere it didn't feel meaningful to me. So there was always this, like, maybe I should be doing something on my own. That's how this thing started from an ambition standpoint. Now, mm -hmm. coming to education is very much broken even today, right? There's so many problems. I think we can go mm -hmm. on and on about it in the podcast. So I felt there was an opportunity to do something that was going to be a lifetime of legacy work that you can be proud of. And uh, that is mm -hmm. super important because in startups, things don't always work out. So you need something else apart from money, etc., to keep you going. So because of those bunch of factors, I decided I can't be this happy Worst case, I become a teacher who teaches maybe like 50 kids. That's still something worthwhile doing. But hope, I mean, thankfully, that's not what it uh, became. Today is much bigger than that. But yeah, that's how it got started here. Apart from money, etc. to keep you going. So because of those bunch of factors, I decided I can't be this happy. Worst case, I become a teacher who teaches maybe like 50 kids. That's still something worthwhile doing. But hope, I mean, thankfully, that's not what it uh, became. Today is much bigger than that. But yeah, that's how it got started here. Let's begin with the foundation of Supernova. Uh, I guess also you started with other people. And what was the thesis for you to start Supernova of what you wanted to solve in education in general or even education in India, if you could give more context about it? See, the number one thing is uh, India has 275 million school-going children, right? Maybe it's higher, quoting the latest available official data point. Now, out of this, if you really think about how many do not have access to a good quality learning environment? It's almost, you know, 220, 230 million. And uh, today with AI, etc., you can literally build an AI tutor for every single child. And uh, even for a high per capita income country like US, uh, it's pretty well understood in education that if everybody has a tutor, the potential that could be realized is just tremendous, right? So there's a huge problem to be solved. That is number one. The number two thing about education and sometimes healthcare, etc., is it's one of those things where being a human is a flaw, right? Like basically all of us, you know, this quote, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. You know this quote? <laughs> it's one of those things, like it's because it's for, it's basically what it means is all of us want to be fit, nobody wants to go to gym. All of us want to be learned, nobody wants to study, right? So when it comes to education, we are fighting against ourselves in some way where it's very hard for people to go through these learning journeys and it doesn't have to be that way. Like if you are sleeping in a classroom, whose problem is it according to the classroom? It is the student's problem. It is not that the class was boring. It is that the student was not motivated, right? If you come, if you attend class for six months and you flunk, you are not capable. It's not that the six month program failed. It's that you failed uh, in that six month program. So, you know, it's a very... Education is one of those industries like that, which is super, <laughs> if you start to think of it as like user, product, gaming, that kind of a lens, 
it's very odd it's like every problem you put it back on the user hey you are not motivated <laughs> you are not capable you know you are too bored right so and there is zero effort on our end to be like maybe i can teach this lesson in a lot less boring way right so i think mm. that kind of uh, education can be a lot more compelling uh, and it can be appealing to the user so you know these two thoughts a huge uh, impact to be made hundreds of millions of student and fundamental changes required here and something like you know in the last few months ai is also happened now it's crystal clear for us you know if you put all of these things together looking at something massively game changing here and lots of value to be built for hundreds of millions of people so you know that's the kind of thing that we came in with yeah and it makes a lot of sense in numbers i could see also for the development of a society you know it starts with education because yeah. uh, those uh, children that have access to education like also yeah. you but it took a lot of effort from uh, your parents and investment it's not a, a privilege that all kids can have and then you could yeah. build uh, you know bigger things that have an impact it's not the access yeah. of the story of every kid and so here you also offering opportunity for even a country to, who knows if everybody can develop through english and other uh, materials and be in yeah. a place Tomorrow, that they can math, science everything yeah yeah, yeah why can't you totally. learn math from an ai tutor why should you not realize your potential because you come from a kind particular kind of socio economic background yes. it was maybe not possible to solve this today that's not the case we can make this happen and you know there's zero reasons for us to hold back we should make it happen so that every children can realize their potential right so yeah i agree with you let's get into uh, then the application of it which is a uh... what we call at tech could you share more about, a bit about more about the journey of using ai because i think it's so new that people are experimenting how they could use it and i never saw the potential of it as a conversational tool you know and that's how i saw it through uh, supernova so could you share more yes. context and a journey around the ai for supernova yeah sure so see uh, like i said i come from a very strong engineering background right so you know Uh, in some ways i'm a nerd like that like good at math good at data science used to do data science for years now right so uh, very naturally initially we looked at ai systems for accelerating content creation right initially it was doing very small incremental things like it'll generate questions it may generate questions with your name and your surrounding so that it feels personal to you be like sophie went to the market like that kind of a question will come to you this kind of very small incremental things right so that's how we were dabbling with it and in between once in a while i'll try to build uh, you know there is this vision of maybe uh, this can this can talk or maybe it can like teach you math so we had to try to build prototypes around it but you know it was always falling short it felt like you know maybe a few more years will be there until then let's let, let's see where it goes right and then around uh, november december when chat gpt came that time that that's when 3.5 came it was a huge thing right and by this time our prototypes are starting to work like what we thought was 5 10 years away are suddenly like we're prototyping and it's starting to work right and i think march when gpt4 came out it was it was better than anything that i could have experienced like i was thinking these ai systems will get to 80% of a human today i can confidently say our ai tutor for english is better than most human teachers that you can find like the 99 percentile uh, human teacher when it comes to its knowledge you know its patience and a bunch of other things so obviously humans have their advantages uh but you know that happened in march and by this time we had already uh, you know we are interacting with kids we went to so i moved i lived in bangalore right now so i moved to second tier third tier towns i lived there in second tier third tier towns all me and a bunch of my teammates would do is go meet kids in these places understand what are they doing and uh, for us we it is not clear okay the technology is good but the kid kid really use it and what do you do to make it usable right so to accelerate that product development i went and lived with these kids every day i'll come back at uh, in the mornings we'll have time right where we'll build a new prototype a new learning experience afternoon evening we'll go experiment then we'll have a bunch of learning so oh my god this is broken this sucks this is boring <laughs> right and then you'll come back again you do this and then when you keep doing it suddenly you're like hey man this thing is actually starting to work these kids are interacting they're learning they're having fun i see something here right and then so quickly by april we had by this time we had done this enough that we had the first few months of content ready as we flee the journey yeah i've worked also on a few educational product with uh, discuss about it and i i saw the main barrier you have two stakeholders you have the children and you have the parents yeah yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. and here you're testing also directly with the children and you have access to test and iterate the product 
could you yeah. share more about that part on business model? Uh, because yeah. this is one of the barriers of educational products. How much have yeah. you involved the parents in the process? And now how do you have access to schools and, and kids? Do you go, do you work with schools? And uh, yeah, where do you find your playtester children uh, on a daily basis when you were building the product and iterating? So for playtesting, that schools are very cooperative. Because like I said, I come from this IIT, which is good because a lot of people look up to IIT and as sort of like, you know, the pinnacle of academics here. So th when you go tell uh, these parents, hey, I'm from an IIT, I'm trying to solve this problem for children or go to schools and say, I'm trying to do this and I'm building this new AI thing. You don't have to pay me anything. You just have to let me in your classroom for an hour and I will make sure it's worth your while. Your kids will like it. I will teach them something new. They're like, okay, maybe this, okay, saying IIT and all. Okay, fine, I'll give it a shot. And when <laughs> we go to the classrooms, we'll make it fun that the kids only leave like when you come back, sir, etc. And so we get a buy-in like that. And then now we have access to lots of schools where if you want to do playtesting, they are more than happy to welcome us and do, okay, I'll I'll free up a class for you. Please come and, you know, interact with the kids, right? So that's how playtesting worked. At the same time, what happened is a bunch of these schools found us to be very missionary. So they don't mind helping you if you're trying to do something noble, right? So mm -hmm. they said, I can't buy this, but... I see you're trying to do something here good for the kids. So I can call parents teacher meeting where you can interact with the parents, right? And so that was again, when we went to these tier two, tier three towns, we could see firsthand who was going to buy our product. Like what are these people like? Uh, what are their apprehensions? Do they like this? Do they understand this AI technology, etc. right? So we are getting a lot of insights even on the selling side. And I got my first few users paying users like that. I'll go to these meetings. I'll talk to a lot of parents. Some people resonate with me and they'll say, okay, I know you've not perfected this, but you seem to be caring about this. So it's okay. Take my money and help my kid. Right. So <laughs> that's how I got my first uh, set of kids. And from there today we've uh, figured out distribution. So I'll tell you what all we've learned, right? The first thing that we learned is the parent that we're going after is not this affluent parent. So I'll tell you why that matters. If you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you're first starting with basics, then slowly you're moving up to things like self-actualization, self-esteem, etc. The crowd that we're dealing with are, you know, people that are middle class, you know, honest, very hardworking people that don't have a lot of money to throw around. So they're always looking out for, I need my son's life to be, daughter's life to be more secure than mine. So these parents, they don't resonate with things like gamification, making things nice. You know, they're not there. They are about... Can you solve this problem for me? Will my child be able to speak good English so that they can get that job or do well in exam? Can they be good at academics? Things like that, right? And you can't blame them. You understand where they're coming from. So that's when we started realizing the parent side of things. So from there, we traded, iterated, and we said, okay, if you want to build this company, let's build it on something that a lot of people consider to be tangible and real and important. And that is English and math. That's how we pivoted there. So choose something that's headache for the parent. Position it very seriously as a learning company. But back it with super strong gamification because the same parent will come back to you and fight with you if the kid cries to do your assignment, right? If the kid is, does not want to use your app after buying, they'll feel yeah. scammed. So yeah. that's where you need all the gamification in the world because the kid will not do something just because the parent bought it. It'll be like, I don't like it and throw away your app if it's bad. <laughs> so that's the balance that you have to strike. And there's a lot of things around distribution, etc. And, uh, you know, this is a two, two and a half year journey. But now we know how to strike a balance between these two stakeholders. Mm. Just quick facts here also for the listener. What has been your funding journey as well? Because uh, as we've met at Lumikai, you've been also backed by Lumikai. Uh, as you started, did you bootstrap as well? Or did you yeah. also receive an initial funding? Yeah. What was your uh, funding journey as well as you get into that big ambition? <laughs> so we knew we had to raise, like we are second time founders, right? Like basically my co-founder uh, scaled something with $15 million, sold it, etc. So we knew at some point we'd taken funding. But again, we were also clear that if we take funding, it's years long journey. Only then you should take it if you're sure. So initially for two reasons, we bootstrapped, right? One, we didn't have a lot of proof that we could do something in education, right? Like, like I said, my background, while education passion is there, I've been teaching. It's not something that I've done it for like tens of thousands of kids or maybe lakhs of kids at that point of time, right? Today we have, but at that point of time, we didn't, right? So, you know, there was not a lot of uh, trust or proof that we could do something here. And secondly, we also wanted to understand, you know, any market before you get in, I believe you should spend some time, you know, making it sort of like a part-time gig where uh, you can sort of understand, do I enjoy working here? Uh, is this a right fit for me as a founder? 
is this something that i want to spend my next five ten years doing right so for those two reasons we bootstrapped initially and that's when because we are bootstrapped we are not answerable uh, to anyone right we could literally do whatever we want so initially i would say it's a super exploratory journey like imagine a bunch of guys uh, me naveen anirudh like all of my co-founders will go to class 10 students would come three teachers would be there and we'll be teaching those kids probability with katan next day we're playing maybe poker and we're teaching something about probability there or maybe uh, you know so many things uh, right or they we built these things called coding games where there'll be games but you have to write code to sort of make the character do stuff inside mm-hmm. the game so you're getting kids to learn coding but uh, but they are th- they, it's there's a very immersive game around that so you know super fast prototyping not really caring about scale anything every week come up with something very novel and you know uh, and then try to wow the kids that's all the focus was right so by this time we had come up with crazy random things like if i show you this is education you a lot of people are like are you serious like this is something kids are learning from this right <laughs> Uh, so by then we also understood about the market etc so we didn't have a we had this aspiration this idea etc but nothing was solid so that's when we met lumikai right these guys unlike you know we are also meeting some traditional uh, ed tech kind of vcs etc who didn't really care you know some did i won't say everybody but you know some didn't really care that much about you know gamification blah who cares like what is the business right that's all they focus on understandably so right less how education works traditionally but these guys were they understood that what we were trying to do they understood what it ne- what it took to sort of create those experiences and i think lumika was able to spot that you know these guys are very passionate and they are trying very novel things so maybe we should back them that's how it started and they really listened to our vision what we have done etc so you know at that point of time i would still say there was a lot of risk in the business and you know they were uh, they took that risk they took the leap of faith on us and that went a long way right because now you have a backer who believes in some of the core things that as much as you do right on was always encouraging you know always experimenting mm. I mean, encouraging you to experiment etc so then lumika came in as soon as lumika came in we raised about a million right uh, like you said yeah that's how it started yeah and how many uh, are you and what will, will it allow you uh, with that uh, extra funding so because i really love the fact that you decided intentionally to bootstrap i think it's the right way especially when you start to explore your product you need the conviction yeah. for yourself first yeah. <laughs> it's a test yeah. for the co-founder team also a discovery yeah. journey that you can do for cheap actually i mean it's your time yeah. And then you don't have to respond to anyone to influence exactly your pace and what you are supposed to answer to. And until that time, then you can grow and scale to exactly. building and growing. So what will it allow you with the funding you get from Lumikai on the building next? What are your priorities? Uh, how are you expanding the product maybe? See, for us, we had to get a... So, you know, if you know Vinod Kosla, he's a amazing investor and amazing entrepreneur as well. So he does this thing called Kosla Ventures. Uh, mm-hmm. might have heard of it right so uh, so we take a lot of his framework so one of the things that he says is you know it's super important to have a very ambitious goal right that's your mount everest peak of mount everest and it's also super important to you don't get to mount everest by just right walking up to the peak you have to go <laughs> sideways zigzag get to base camps you know refill yourself uh, get some assets and keep moving forward to reach the peak it's not one straight line right so while our goal you know not even exaggerating when i'm saying to build an ai tutor for every child hopefully like millions if not hundreds of million kids will someday be using it right so but you have to start somewhere so our first case base campus we wanted to build a business where we understood distribution cash flows were coming we are growing and monetizing and you know the business is working out it's growing at 30% month on month and we are close to being cash flow positive i think what it allow this capital allows us to do is i think we can easily get to tens of thousands of kids learning via this platform uh, with real learning outcomes maybe a few million dollars in uh, revenue if not like tens of millions of dollars in revenue we should be able to get to that just with this and this is also like because we've executed well fortunately enough we're getting a lot of inbound so I'm, i think something might materialize uh, in the next few months where we'll get some more round of funding as well more like just expand the tech and product and academic team etc so that's what it's allowed us to do where we'll continue to invest is make the brand stronger invest on tech product and academic talent uh, you know very focus on re- very focus be very focused on retention and learning outcomes and you know get that brand that people rave about and a lot of people want to come in and then the tech is there it's still scale anyway so you know that's why we're doing that 
Thanks. For uh, the last minutes we have, I wanted to get to into the specifics of the uh, product because, of course, for the listeners, not everyone will have access to it unless they are subscribers or parents, or maybe they want actually to also uh, do it for uh, the kids. How could you break down the product and what it offers? You showed it to me, but maybe in a high level, because that's very interesting also how you approach exactly uh, teaching English, which is not the classic way. Yeah, so basically, if you look at a classroom, right, it's very unnatural. It's a very unnatural way of picking up a language, right, where you are told the rules. I'm pretty sure all of us, you know, all of us know one language, at least most of us, right, uh, which is our mother tongue. And most of us won't know any grammar rules in our mother tongue. But I can speak. I'm not making my sentences based on one adjective plus one subject. I don't know. It's not how people think, right? So first of all, that doesn't, it's very unnatural. And that is why I think if you see after semesters and semesters of learning a language, kids, people still can't speak, but they can read and write. So something similar is going on in India as well. So in India, there are these things called English medium schools. Uh, you know, it's very unique. Like you won't find that in places like Korea, Japan, etc. Mm. Because people learn in their mother tongue. In India, about 20-30% of the population actually learns every single subject via English. Despite that, that means every day you're spending 6-7 hours, you know, reading English, writing English, everything that you do is in English in your school. Despite that, kids can't speak English, right? So what does that tell you? Simply making them write, read, you know, answer a bunch of grammar questions is not getting them anywhere when it comes to speaking. And, you know, the point of a language is to be able to speak and communicate, right? Not really just do a bunch of questions. So <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous that way. So our thing is, first thing that we said is every day they're going to speak. It's going to be enabled by this AI and we'll put them in random situations. So one day they have to talk with the app and sort of buy vegetables in a very role playish kind of a scenario. One day they're playing a game where they have to speak to play, like a 20 questions game. You have to ask a bunch of questions to sort of get some clues to find this person. So every day you have to speak. And we are creating this scenario where you're not like unnaturally speaking, you're like trying to play a game and you're speaking as a byproduct, right? Or some days we just make you listen, watch a nice story, right? For a 20 minute story. And then you chat about it. It doesn't like the 20 minutes doesn't even feel like learning, but you are consuming 20 minutes of English content, trying to understand what's going on in the story. And when you see a new word and I see a picture, you make that connection instantly in your brain, like, ah, okay, this is what a fawn is. It's the child of a deer, right? Like things like that, mm. right? So that's so that's how that pedagogy is, where uh, we are trying to make it education a cons, you know, a byproduct. Uh, you know, we are structuring these experiences where you're just trying to get through the experience. You're focused on the experience itself, but you're learning as a byproduct. That's a core rule, right? And then the AI, what it does is, it can speak to you. It can understand what you're speaking. It can understand every word, you know, what's your pronunciation, how off is it, right? So it's very intelligent. It can give you that feedback in natural language. And, uh, you know, all of that data is uh, available for the model to sort of understand you better and give you adaptive exercises. So that AI brings a lot again to the pedagogy. And lastly, these are kids. So things like gyms, badges, streaks, community events, contests. These are things that kids are super excited by, right? So... You know, again, you use that for learning. So these three things, I would say, come together to make a, a very solid learning journey for a kid where the kid, uh, you know, our initial vision of it shouldn't be as boring. I think maybe we are like 25, 30 percent there. Long way to go, mm. but, you know, significantly better. Yeah. Uh, and this is also very educative for me, uh, remembering how I learned, right? Uh, until we had the di discussion, I, I never thought about it. And I was like, that's right. And, and it's so difficult to learn a language, but it's what you showed me in the demo. It's amazing through yeah. the game. It's a conversation that happens endlessly. Yeah. Like you always have someone available and as you open Supernova to talk to you, right? Which is not yeah. possible in real life because you need to go to a class or have someone available. 24-7 um, this AI is available to you, speaking, listening, giving you feedback. So you don't have to feel shy. You can. It's infinitely patient, infinitely compassionate, you know, um, and infinitely intelligent as well. So that is what is available to you 24-7. And with the, around all of these contexts. So, you know, that's that's how we are trying to think through this. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's an interesting part where AI, we many of us want to believe that it cannot replace some presence of humans. But for the part of compassion, and teachers are human, right? And sometimes they just don't have the patience or the, anyone teaching. And here yeah. it's uh, exactly guaranteed because it doesn't have any emotion to be <laughs> not there listening yeah. and patient. That's beautiful, actually. <laughs> No, yeah, you can control exactly, you know, like you can control everything about its personality and at scales. You never had this kind of, we've never had something like this 
uh, you know uh, since the beginning of our civilization right like this is the first time it's magical actually if one year back one and a half years back if you told me something like this was going to happen i would have predicted maybe it's like 50 years away right <laughs> that's how magical it is like more you work with this uh, i think uh, you know definitely there's going to be some things that are very human that humans do but i think it can take up a lot of our things and you know just create that abundant uh, resources that makes everybody a winner in some sense, sense because of all of this technological innovation right so yeah mm. And my uh, last question to close this conversation today, there's so much more I would love to ask, but that's for another time and not on the yeah. podcast. Is there yeah. something I didn't ask you that I should have asked and future aspiration and outlook for you towards the end of the year or next year that you would like to share at last? I think we want to be in a place where there are solid learning outcomes and retention where the kids love to use the product. Right now, our M3 is about, M1 is about 95. M3 is about 75. Now that sounds good until you realize these are paying customers so they have a lot of incentive right so we want to get to a place where uh, the course completion rates are in the range of 90 plus only then we have i think this product you can claim that it's kind of working and with a lot of customer love where the kids don't think of it as a chore but rather they're excited to come to the platform and learn but the second thing is when they do engage are they doing something meaningful right that is the second thing where the learning outcomes are guaranteed so i think by next year we want to be in a place where our m6 is like 95 and uh, there are very tangible learning outcomes that the kid and the parents are proud of that would be one solid goal you know we want to get to maybe a lakh kids a lakh is 0.1 million kids uh, on our platform learning doing english maybe we'll launch math we are looking into it right now where there's somebody who's interacting with you like there's an ai uh, right next to you and you're solving sums together you're making mistake it'll be like hey mm. hey no you put an extra one there take a look at it again go back can you think what is a mistake here? That kind of a very a new kind of an experience we're trying to build. So we want to have our math product out. We want to have like a lakh kits on it. And revenue is a byproduct, but still it matters to the business. Maybe we'll be at like 5 to $10 million of revenue. This is where we want to be in a year from mm. now. Thanks a lot, Rishi, for your time. It was super inspiring. And I uh, love so much uh, how candid you were and you put your heart into what you share today and even like in what you're doing and using your skills, your brain, every ounce of yourself, you know. So it was very inspiring. And uh, thanks again for joining. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, see you, Sophie. Thanks for listening to this latest episode of the Rise and Play podcast. I am growing a community of conscious leaders across the industry and beyond. If you want to join this movement, please share the podcast with other conscious leaders because we have so much more we can learn from each other. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate the show on Spotify or your other favorite podcast platform. It will help other growing leaders to discover the show and benefit from the valuable insights. If you would like to grow rapidly your leadership skills, you can find more insights on riseandplay.io, where you will also find my free masterclass on conscious leadership and other resources that I offer. Have a great week and remember to take care of yourself. Until the next time, 